welcome to Expedition Networking, a special segment of the Networking RX podcast. I'm Frank Egan, founder and president of Amspirit Business Connections and your host for this program. For those of you who are familiar, on the Networking RX podcast, we share information and have conversations with experts, such as authors, researchers, and social scientists. And all of these programs are aimed at helping you learn how to become better at building professional relationships and understanding why they work. In this Expedition Networking segment, however, we're going to bring on successful entrepreneurs and unique professionals and explore their networking adventure and learn how they used relationships to create lasting success. Today on Expedition Networking, we have Diane Kane. She is passionate about helping people build better connections so that families, businesses, and communities thrive. She is a DISC, DISC, D-I-S-K, certified human behavior consultant. She's the owner of a business called Spark Leadership Development, and she's an executive director with the John Maxwell team. If you're not familiar with John Maxwell, um, you need to get out from underneath your rock. Uh, he's written, I don't know, 50, 100 books. There are 21 irrefutable laws of, uh, of leadership. Um, if you're a leader, leadership type person, you need to know about John Maxwell. And uh, Diane is, uh, I guess, one of his disciples, best way to put it, right? Uh, yeah, I guess that would be accurate. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, Frank, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here with you and, and talk relationships. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Well, um, let's, I guess let's roll through and give us uh, a nickel tour of your life. Um, and, you know, we don't need the whole thing, but you're certainly your professional life. You, you know, you, you didn't go to school to be a John Maxwell disciple. Um, I mean, in a way you did, I guess, but, um, yeah, but that, right? came, that came along later. So anyhow, it did. It did come along later. And so my, my nickel tour. So I'm born and raised in, in the little estate in the Union, Rhode Island. And so the typical Rhode Island, we don't like to leave home too much. I went to, to school at Johnson & Wales University, got my bachelor's in business management. And then I kind of landed in financial services and grew up through the ranks in that. So I worked in financial services. Then I worked in healthcare for a little while and then fi finalized my career, my career in Bank of America. So always within customer service though. So obviously relationships are the key when you're, when you're doing customer service. Um, it was when I was in Bank of America and understanding that I was developing other leaders that I wanted to be better at that. But I also had this, I'm, I'm a learner by, by, by heart. Um, and I can see by your bookshelf. So are you, Frank, we share yeah. the love of learning. Yes. Right? Um, and so started on my, as I started to go up through the ranks, I started to get more and more interested in leadership development and personal development, and also in, in human relations. Because when I was in my role at CVS Pharmacy, I wound up being, because we were in a separate building, I wound up kind of being the default HR manager within mm -hmm. the facility. That's a lot of learning, right? Yeah. Well, that's where I learned that people are messy. They're wonderful and they're messy all at the same time. I was going to say um, it's probably a lot of babysitting. Yes, that's what it feels like when yeah. you're managing people or you're leading people. You become the mother, the father, the psychologist, the yeah. doctor, all of the things, right? And yeah. and so I started to get more and more fascinated about what made people tick. Um, it was early on in my career when I was first introduced to behavioral assessments. So that's where the DISC profile came in. So you name it. DISC, Myers-Briggs, StrengthsFinder, Enneagram. Um, there's one other one that I'm missing. If you take any one of those, your, your normal or natural behavioral style is going to come out, but it also affects how we communicate with each other. And so I, that was something that I used throughout my career. And then when, when I joined the John Maxwell team oof, back in 2011, it'll be the 10 year anniversary of the John Maxwell team this year. Um, to really get a little bit more refined on developing my leadership skills because I was developing other leaders at that point, not just developing staff. I was developing leaders who were leading people, um, but also to refine my coaching because to have really candid conversations, you need to understand the framework of that. And that's what the John Maxwell team had, had given me. And then through that, it also gave me the burning desire to be able to create more impact 
um, with other people. So ultimately, you know, I loved my career at the bank, but there was always something that was pulling me forward to be able to make a greater impact with the people that I was working with. Um, and in 2016, I was provided that liberation because we had a reorganization and my position was eliminated. And that was the time for me to jump into now or never, let's make this, let's make this run at entrepreneurial life. And that was an eye opener for me, Frank, yeah. I was talking in the beginning about, you know, networking and building relationships and having conversations and networking for your next career position and networking for business development are similar, but different. Yeah. And that was, that was eye opening for me. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, yeah. And I've, you know, my wife's company went through a reorganization and uh, I told her, and you know, she was nervous about it. I said, listen, it's going to work out either way. You know, because if you're there, you're there. If they let you go, it will be a blessing. I have talked to so many people that it is a blessing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's I, I left where I worked. I was young, 30s, wasn't married, didn't have kids. Mm -hmm. um, so it was I, it just was easier. But it's I mean, it's I, I hadn't worked there that long. You know, I hadn't been become dependent. I didn't have a house, you know, all these things. Well, um, yeah. yeah. And those are the kind of the things that keep people in employment. And but you had mentioned about, OK, the difference. Talk to me a little bit about the difference between development um, and networking in customer service, you know, trying to build this John Maxwell business now. And, mm -hmm. you know, aside from the notion of paycheck every two weeks, next paycheck, don't really know. Um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we, when you were talking about that, that's what kept me in the bag for, for like two years longer than I really wanted to be there Yeah, was because of the comfort, right? The comfort and yeah. the certainty of a paycheck. And I think 2020 de demonstrated there is no such thing as certainty. We get to create what we want. Yeah. Um, and so in, in having that, that networking and building relationships within, you know, I want to move to my next position. You don't, you still have the certainty, right? You, yeah. If you don't get the next position, it's okay. If somebody else gets another position, you know, you need to still make those connections and have those conversations um, versus I'm out in this big ocean all by myself or it feels that way when you're stepping out of something yeah. comfortable into that discomfort, right? You, you've stepped out of the boat. <laughs> if you're a person of faith, right. you're, you're totally there. Um, and now you're, you've gone from, you're still selling yourself, I guess, in the corporate world, but you're selling yeah. yourself in a whole different way in the service when you're stepping out into a business for yourself and you're kind of the service that's being sell, sold. So that was that was a really, um, it was a mindset shift that took me a little while to get through because it was just, if I got rejected for a position, I still had something to fall back on. If I had a right. conversation and somebody rejected me and I do rejection in air quotes. Um, it, it's, it felt like it was me personally and not the offering that I was making. So that yeah. was, was a lot of that, that had to be overcome. Yeah. Um, and you know, that happens to most salespeople, right? Yeah, no, it's, um, it rejection is an acquired taste. Um, right. I guess is the way to put it, but I guess, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I love where you're going with a lot of this because I'm a person of analogies as well. And I always mm -hmm. looked at it as, when I was in a corporate job, if I got rejected for, hey, sign me this client or whatever, it was akin to being at the dance and somebody saying they wouldn't dance with you. Whereas the other was asking somebody to dance and realizing, okay, now I've got nobody to go to the dance with. Um, and so it's a whole different thing. And okay, I'm being rejected. You won't dance with me. I'll turn with somebody else. I still have somebody to dance with. Mm -hmm. Here, I just not even get to go to the dance. Um, but, it, you know, but that impacts that really impacts everything. If you stop and think about it, you know, I was pretty connected in my corporate job mm -hmm. just because I'm a chatty person. Um, <laughs> but when you get out there and you depend upon, when you depend upon those relationships for a livelihood, mm -hmm. you get a whole lot more tolerant. In fact, I remember somebody, 
I was having a conversation with a friend of mine and I was talking to somebody who's kind of a client. It's more complicated, but anyway, I was talking to him and I came back over to my friend who I've known for years. He says, Oh, I can't believe you waste time with him. You know, he's a big fat slob or something like that. You know, it was, oh. it was very disparaging. And, and I'm like, um, you know, I don't look at him like that, mm-hmm. you know, and it's not, it wasn't about the money per se, but it was just more, I, you know, I can't, I can't operate in these clicks in this, for in this entrepreneurial world. No, no, not at all. And, you know, that's where I say we just, we end up being more tolerant of, you know. Because there's always more to the story, right? We're yeah. only seeing, we're only seeing through one lens a lot of yeah. the time too, right? You yeah. know, or how often we get compartmentalized, right? In, in what we're doing, because we only see the, we only see an individual in one arena a lot of times. So that's what our, our own perception is built around. And like you, you know, because of my position in the bank, I was, I was in a senior leadership role. So I was pretty connected And the role that I did was, it was enterprise wide. So I was connected within the U S but I was also connected globally to those global leaders. So right. it was in, and when you're sitting there in, in your comfortable container, that's your normal day to day. And then when you come out of your normal container into the, the real world, right. If, if, or the world that was there, but you just weren't aware of. I think right. Ivan Meisner calls it, we, we live in two caves. It's our cave of the office and then our cave at home. Yeah. And we kind of commute between the two. And then when you deviate from that, now you're out into the rest of the world, you underestimate what you know, and then you also underestimate how long it takes to build those connections. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I was in my corporate role for 10 years. So I was, I knew everybody. And here I was now going into this unknown of where I knew a lot of people, but I also didn't realize how many people I didn't know and how small my circle really was. Um, When you jump into the entrepreneurial world, you need to make your circle as big as you can possibly make it. Yeah. All right. At least so that people know who you are. And that takes time. No, I totally, I, that totally resonates with me. I was, I was the center of the universe as far as knowing people where I worked, I knew everybody It was on five floors. I knew everybody. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize at the time is they all kind of knew each other as well. So it was very lack of a better term, very incestuous, you know, right. Everybody knew everybody, but you can't have that Mm -hmm. in in the entrepreneurial arena. You've got to, you've got to live in lots of different worlds. I need to get involved at church, my kid's school. I need to, Mm -hmm. You know, I need to know my neighbors, not that I'm going to be pitching people on clients, Mm -hmm. um, but you just need to kind of know, you just need to know people in a a different Mm -hmm. sort of a way. And it's a hard thing to explain to people. um, And you're right. That's a big reason that holds people back from leaving. So let's switch gears here real quick. Um, Let's go back in time. You know, you're a senior in high school 10 years ago. Uh, (laughs) Well, thank you. (laughs) Now you're a senior in high school. What advice would you give yourself? You know, hey, um, I mean, don't not don't date him or anything like that. But just you know, as far as you know, professional type. Mm. It was when it, when I saw that on your on your prep sheet. I was yeah. like, oh wow, that's a great question, and I had to think on that one a little bit and. And it was not be afraid to use my voice and that people really aren't scary because at 18 years old, I was very, very introverted and very shy. I was very comfortable in my small circles or with people I knew. And I, but going into a room of strangers was very anxiety inducing for me. Um, And, and I would tend to hide off in the corner until I could see someone who looked friendly. Right. Mm. Translate that into having to go into networking as you're opening your own business. Yeah. That 18 year old had to go away real quick. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I like you have to put your pla- yourself in places where you need to meet people. Yeah. And once I started and, and I credit the John Maxwell team for this because I, I put myself into a role within the team because when we're bringing new people on board, when you're first entering into our main event, of 3000 people and you're all new and you're like, Oh my gosh, where do you go? One of my responsibilities was to make people feel comfortable. 
Um, that helped me go into a networking situation and be the one that made somebody feel comfortable. I, I looked for that 18 year old me in the room who was standing in the corner going, yeah. Oh my God, who do I talk to? Don't make eye contact. People are scary too. I just, I'm just here to meet people and me and, and get to know them. I'm not here to sell them anything. I'm just here to make friends. And once I started with, I'm here to make friends and you know, a stranger is just a person you a friend you haven't made yet. Um, God, I would have had so much more fun, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and I would have spoken up much earlier in my career. That was some of the feedback that I had gotten even later on in my career was, you know exactly what you need and your voice needed to be heard at that table. Why didn't you speak up? Um, yeah. So if you have a thought, share it. I think that's important too. Yeah, I was on a podcast this morning and uh, the host calls it the big lie, you know, that we we give away all this power and we think people are bigger than they are. And we just need to realize that we really matter. Um, yes. You know, and I think we, I don't want to say, every, well, even the people who were popular in the cliques, um, I think they were scared to death. Absolutely. Of being, you know, geez, if ever, you know, if people knew what my mom did to me and made me wear to bed, you know, I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. um, they would yeah. be mortified, but they kind of put themselves on this pedestal. Um, and uh, I don't know. So interesting <laughs> and not surprising, but very, but very interesting. Um, well, what did you, what did you want to be when you were in high school? I mean, did, uh, again, it's, I want to be on the John Maxwell team. When no. I was in high school, it was, there were buckets, police officer, firefighter, teacher, whatever. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, Exactly, exactly. I was at that crossroads when I when it was time to make the decision, right? So you, you get the, the, what is it, the guidance counselor that talks yeah. to you about what you want to do and kind of gives you some suggested paths, right? Um, and I fell in one of two buckets, I wanted to, to teach. And then I also wanted to go into business. And my deciding factor of which way I was going to go was around, um, was around how much money am I going to make? Right. And I knew, and, and some of that drove me, right? Because my parents, I mean, we were, we were okay. We were talking, you know, severe poverty. We weren't in that. We, sure. we made things, but you know, there were, there were months that I watched my mother cry writing the bills, right? Where was it going to come from? There was, you know, too much month at the end of the money. Yep. Um, and when I started doing my salary investigations, you know, teachers worked, X number of days and you could have the whole summer off. But, you know, at that point in time, $23,000 was not appealing to me. Right. And looking at what the potential was in the salary for business and the flexibility of where business could kind of, there was more options within business in my mind at that point in time um, was to go business. So I find it ironic that I have married the two together now. I'm like, I've circled back to exactly yeah. where I started. I was going to say the exact same thing when you said that, um, and I think the travesty in all of this is, well, part of it is it didn't exist then. The whole notion of coaching and it didn't, it wasn't, you know, it didn't exist. It was, is it, as it was explained to me, it's really been a function of the 90s when they started to let people go from the military and they had all these people with all, we need to help these people. So that's when, you know, coaching started to come into being. And then mm -hmm. people on Wall Street were saying, you know what, you're helping that general, you know, can you help me go from making a million dollars a year to two million dollars a year? And then it just kind of expanded from there. Um, but the, I think the travesty in that is, is that these guidance counselors and I don't want to, you know, lump mm -hmm. them in as being evil. They, you know, they do what they do um, based on what they're based on their situation, what they know, but right. now the way the world is, and I tell my kids, this is there aren't buckets, right? There it's, there's, you can invent something. You can invent your own bucket, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and really I, that's what John Maxwell has done is he's invented a bucket that yeah. someone like you, and I know a lot of John Maxwell people mm -hmm. um, and everybody's bucket looks a little different. Oh, absolutely. I mean, our team comes from literally all walks of life. Yeah, I mean, we're in 160 countries and you, you come in for, you know, you come in to coach, you come in to train, you come in to speak. 
And we all look very, very different. Yep. We all have very, very different backgrounds. We're, you know, and because John's origin was in the faith in faith world, and he's yeah. once a pastor, always a pastor, but the the teaching points of what a leadership was and the relationship building of what he brought from his pastorate into the, the business world on how we treat human beings. Yeah. And how we develop human beings and how we value human beings is what what transformed leadership in in most cases and is still and it's still working on that. I mean, you know, there's people know the difference between a boss and a manager and a leader, um, but they always can't put their finger on what those are. We just know we like to follow. Um, and you know, from the coaching aspects too, there's, there's so many aspects of coaching. There's the coach who's really more of a mentor who's telling you how to do things or helping you correct. And then there's the, the really the more authentic coaching that helps you really identify where that limiting, that big lie, like you were talking about, or that limiting belief came from. Right. And even for me, it was through the process of, of stepping into something uncomfortable and, and doing some speaker training it, it came out of a benign comment from my grandfather. Children are meant to be seen and not heard. There was the source of my shyness and being quiet and not opening my mouth. And when that popped up in my head to understand that that was kind of that undercurrent of what held me back, it wasn't so scary anymore. Right. It was, well, let me talk to you about what we needed to do. And everybody, everybody inherently wants to be seen. Everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to be accepted. Um, and, and that's what I, I love to help people do, especially within groups and within organizations and um, how we make connections. You know what? We, we don't have all of the answers, but we know somebody who might have another nugget of an answer that's going to help you right. grow, develop. And hey, you know, as, as my husband says it, I know a guy. <laughs> or right. A girl, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you no, never I, know what happens from making those connections after that. No, I mean that you spot on. I guess this is a great segue to kind of talk about your business a little bit. Um, you know, types of you know how could the listeners help you, types of referrals, opportunities you're mm-hmm. looking for. Um, we're in a beautiful time of COVID because the there are no boundaries anymore. There are no, you know, we can go anywhere. No, they're not. They're not. And and so I, I like to say, because like you in the introduction, she's a DISC human behavior consultant. So DISC is just the tool. It's the assessment right. tool. Kind of like the, the guidance counselor has. We have a tool. Right. And the tool is really just to kind of help bring self-awareness. And I love to bring that in because it helps people understand why they're wired the way they're wired and why we communicate the way we communicate. And it also talks about some of our driving fears that are there. And, and I love DISC because it's simple, you know, and if you take any one of the assessments, your style, your wiring is all going to come out the same. You are who you are. And what I help people do through that is build better connections. And by building better connections, it's an understanding of my husband's very much more of an introvert than I am. And it doesn't mean that he's not interested in life. It just means he likes quiet a little bit more. And I like more adventure, right? Um, It also helps with, I'm going to go out and I'm going to drive and I'm going to make things happen where somebody else, 69% of the world likes our stability, likes our safety, likes our consistency. Yeah. Um, and that's so, so visible right now within COVID, right? The, the big massive disruption of change and how discomforting and uncomfortable that is. Um, it helps, it, I like to help people understand what drives that behavior. Um, who do I work with? I, I work with individuals, I work with organizations. On the individual side, I find myself working more and more with commission salespeople um, and also with the managers, senior directors, and, and the business owners who have teams that aren't quite working the way that they work um, or could work better. And so I usually start off with DISC because everybody's got common language. Then there's an understanding of who's got the massive gifts and why is it? Why are they maybe necessarily not so great in the role that they're in? If you've got someone who's very detail-oriented in black and white, and you have put them in a customer facing, I need you to talk to 100 people a day, 
and they like to be quiet, you're, you're automatically setting them up for failure. Let's just rearrange some people and put them in the right places. Um, and then when I work with individuals, it's more of a deeper dive into their, their assessments, but also do some group coaching around how, what do I do with this now, right? You've given me this insight to myself. Now, now how do I translate this into the relationships that I have? Um, and what I have found is, is, you know, the rela- relationships are just the key to everything. Yeah. Yes. Everything. We, yeah. we are in relationship at home. We're in relationship with our family. We're in relationship with our peers. We're in relationship with our community. We're in relationship with our customers. You can't get away from people or relationships. Um, and so if I can help people make those better, then, then that excites me. And I, I unlock people and I'm really not as bad as I thought I was because we, we like to tell ourselves lots of lies and you yeah. know, we're programmed to the negative. So let me help you find your giftedness and let's concentrate on that. Yeah. Um, and, no, and there's a lot of people out there that need the help. They, mm-hmm. they, you know, they don't wear a big sign, but they need the help. And yes. um, so, right. right. I mean, what the mental health conversations that we're having now as a result yeah. of, of 2020. Well, I really appreciate your time on the, the program today. This has been fun. Thanks for having me. I, I've loved our conversation. We could talk for hours. To wrap things up, remember, we're looking for some enterprising business types to join our team as franchisees of Amspirit Business Connections. Our franchisees work with entrepreneurs, sales representatives, and professionals in their area to help them become more successful through networking and the exchange of quality business referrals in a structured weekly morning meeting. This is a unique franchise opportunity you see because these meetings are in the morning, a successful business type or professional can add this franchise opportunity onto what they're already doing. Again, all of our franchisees do something else. For a couple hours in the morning, a few mornings a week, these franchisees work the Amspirit Business Connections model. The rest of the time, Their attorneys, accountants, realtors, coaches, and consultants of various kind. The wonderful thing is that not only do our franchisees realize a financial gain from operating the Amspirit Business Connections model, but the business networks that they build and develop become a great source of referrals for their primary business as well. Perhaps you know someone, perhaps you are that someone. Whatever the case, to learn more about the Amspirit Business Connections franchise opportunity, please contact me using the email in the show notes or the one we provide at the end of this program. Thanks for joining us on the Networking Rx podcast. Please put what you've learned into action today and let us know if you have questions, comments, or ideas for future topics. You can email them to us at podcast at amspirit.com. That's A-M-S-P-I-R-I-T dot com. Finally, so you never miss an episode, be sure to subscribe to the Networking Rx podcast through iTunes, Overcast, or however you receive your podcasts. Now get out and network with someone. The Networking Rx podcast is a copyright production of Amspirit Business Connection. All rights reserved.